Welcome to Two Goals. I'm Maria Laura. And I'm Katia. And we're ready to record an extra episode from the Dealership Women Football Series with another brilliant professional choosing to prepare herself to lead a more inclusive industry for all. Jenny Ning Pico is a Colombian business administrator with several years of experience overseas in areas such as project management, sponsorship development, and counseling in player status. An advocate for many social causes and an influencer herself, Jenny is here to open her path on how she made it into the most important governing body in football. Jenny, welcome to Two Goals. Thank you so much, Maria Laura and Katia. I'm super happy to be here with you. Well, Jenny, we would like to start with a lovely coincidence. I mean, I think Katia is done with this at this point because she feels like in Colombia, there is only one region, <laughs> which is called Santander. <laughs> but this is amazing. I'm, I'm always happy to have uh, colleagues from my region. And yeah. well, you are from Barranca Bermeja, which is a medium sized city in Colombia, two hours from Bucaramanga, my hometown. That's right. uh, That's right. but, but you made this huge decision from a really young age, move from, Barranca Bermeja to Chambéry in France to complete an exchange high school year. Why was this important to you? What did you hope to accomplish with this? Mm -hmm. So since a little child, it was my dream to study in Europe. That was clear. Uh, I don't know exactly where it came from, uh, but I was determined to do everything I could to, um, yeah, for that dream to come true. I must say that I, was growing in a family or an environment with many limitations, but I had parents that were always telling me, hey, dream big, go for it, you need to persevere for, for what you want to achieve. So I assume, and I, I strongly believe that that was the way how, um, yeah, I, I should say that to go for it. And, and I started learning languages. I started learning about how does it mean or what does it mean to live in Europe? And that increased my desire to, to go for it. And so against all odds, my parents were a great support and I started the journey. Fantastic. I mean, and you, you, you dreamed it and you achieved it, yeah. right? <laughs> so you're a person exactly. you set the goals and you, you go for it. We'll go for them in this case. In 2007, you joined the, the University Institute of Technology to pursue a degree in business administration. What was the reason behind choosing this degree in France? And are there some specific features from the French culture that you still apply today? I need to start with the fact that my parents had a small business in, in Barranca Bermeja in Colombia. And as a small business, family business, I was helping them um, with every little and big task that needed to be for the shop. And I really enjoyed doing everything. So it was from selling uh, to collecting the debts from the customers to decorating the store to handling uh, nice and not so nice people, uh, the admin work. So all, all or being part of that business really gave me this desire to one day uh, start my own business. So that's the reason how then I, when I went to France, I thought I really would like to go into the business administration, but also with this entrepreneurial touch. Um, and uh, what you mentioned about the French culture, I would say two things, say it with me. One is that meals are a prime time for socializing, something that in Colombia meals are important, but you don't socialize as much and socialize in the sense of um, having deep discussions and really spending a lot of time <laughs> uh, at the table. And the second thing would be a reading and the pride um, for their language. So the French people really love their language and writing and argumentation. And that is something I really took from them and that still today. You mentioned something really important, which is that we, we don't learn this, this uh, opportunity of how to network, I think. We, we focus a lot in, in many, I don't think this is only Colombian, but in many of our, of our degrees, maybe academic degrees, we're always thinking about the importance of theory and I need to do, I don't know, know how to run this model, for example, in economics in my case. 
but you don't know when you're going to meet the person that might change your life or give you an opportunity. And I think we're still kind of like lacking of this in from from high school. I think you you don't know how to communicate properly or how how to make a conversation out of culture of sports even. I think that's that's really crucial what you're saying and and that's what we're trying to do here for people to mm -hmm. to understand that there are skills who are beyond academic degrees. Yeah, absolutely. I do believe that the social skills um, are essential and also trying to find the gold in everybody because when you know that the person doesn't matter how the person looks or what title the person has uh, in front of you you know that you can learn something and that this can be uh, a key that can unlock a door maybe today or maybe in 10 years you will really see potential in every conversation you have and you are not trying to select people but really to use every opportunity and speaking about opportunities, you didn't end up in France. You moved to Switzerland and you complete another professional degree related to sports, uh, related to business administration too. And then you started working for Signer Management as an office administrator, then for Compassion International, another company as representative and a sponsorship development. And after that, as project lead for the International Christian Fellowship. Mm -hmm. So we, we check all these roles and you, there is a lot of planning, a lot of budgeting, a lot of organizing involved. And can you please tell us, I mean, tell us and our future talents who are inspired about this podcast, the importance about developing small tasks. I mean, we tend to forget that even for our dream roles, we need to do like small, routinary, uh, develop this, this routinary skills. and what should we learn about them? How should we approach them to try and, and fulfill our, our success in our work environment? Maria, I really love this question because I have done many boring tasks. <laughs> and there is something I would like to say at this point, and is that having a greater purpose in mind for you as an individual and for the work you are doing is essential. And that is something that has helped me a lot when you only focus in the small task in the routinary things that you don't like it you lose focus on the impact you are making but when you have this big picture um, of what could be when you do or don't do the small task then it it gives more sense and i strongly believe that when we are faithful and excellent in doing the small things we will be entrusted with more in due time. This, I, I have seen it in my life. I have seen it in my friends and everybody around me, but just to be really faithful. Um, something that I see as well um, is that people want to achieve big things by taking shortcuts. And I would say uh, when it's really a mistake when we really try to avoid the process. The process is the most important part of growing because the process is where we develop our character. And now I'm talking rather in the leadership area. I think there is nothing worse than to see a person having a title of a leader, but with a very poor character. I prefer to see a person with a very strong character and maybe no title, but doing great things. So that's the power of the small things. And yeah, what you said, I'm sure we will take this uh, for some content to put it out there because we need it. And you were talking about uh, the process and I can, it's my own experience and a lot of people experienced right now is during this pandemic, a lot of people, they, they cannot achieve things or in a way that people that are in the entry level in the football industry or other industries all, all over the world, it's taking time to achieve a position, a small, great position. It depends how you see it. Uh, because a small position, as you said, can be a great one if you take the advantage and you, you consider everything. But actually, this whole process, in my case, it has been one year, for example, we are developing a lot. It's up to us if we want or not to do it. But during this process, we can learn and we can develop. And it's, it's about the small things, as you said, and taking advantage of them. It's perfect. 
And I, I also think that by doing small tasks, it gives us the opportunity to learn new skills. Yeah. So it's really a matter of opportunities. Exactly. It's, it's about what we are talking about uh, on uh, off. That is uh, our selfish <laughs> project here. <laughs> We've been learning a lot <laughs> through this. And uh, it, it is a huge thing because it takes time to, to do everything, of course. But in, this, in the small things, we are developing our skills. And everybody should, should uh, look up to this as a, a great way to do something for, the, for their lives because one day mm -hmm. they can achieve something. We already know that Maria will be the president, <laughs> at least first in Colombia and after. <laughs> I want to, to go write for it. it. <laughs> well, Thank like, you, Katya. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> this is recorded, so. Exactly. <laughs> well, actually, everything that we were talking about, yeah, and you actually also touched upon before um, about what you take out from the conversation you have. And it's from the, our knowledge that we share and learn um, or our personal skills that we develop, but also from the work we do that we can take exp our experience, work experience, and we can take uh, some pieces to our life. So, and we know that this makes us develop skills or, or a knowledge, some characteristics which goes behind, beyond work, uh, it's normal. Um, and mm -hmm. in this case, related to this working experience we talked before in this uh, conversation, how did they shape your way of seeing responsibility towards uh, changing people's lives? Should we all commit at least part of our lives to try and help others? Can you leave your, uh, your perspective to our audience? Sure, I must say, um, as maybe you have heard from me, I am a purpose-driven person. So my purpose is to take my talents, is to take my knowledge and resources to impact and improve people's lives. And it has, me, it has been like written on stone on my heart. <laughs> um, but I also see that in the business world, it's very easy to get caught in the idea of looking for the self-benefit. And I am not saying that look for that is completely wrong it's, it's not about that but I do believe that when you think of others you also expand your, your world uh, then it's something bigger than yourself so for example I see what you are doing with this podcast of course it is a self-benefit for you and for me and for everyone who has participated but you have in mind this purpose that is also reaching the other people is giving value and giving tools to the other people who are uh, on the way to achieve what we have achieved and of course more because that's what we want right um, so I think it, it has to do a lot um, with that and another thing that comes to my mind a former leader told me once how do you want people to remember you in your burial how do you want people to remember you in your burial? That question helps me a lot to put into perspective everything that I am doing that is not just for a business cause, but is for a greater cause that has to do with impacting people's lives. I mean, that's that's crucial what you're saying because we tend to, to forget that we, even if we are, I, I don't know, like unemployed, we think that we don't have the power to help someone. I mean, that's that's a problem. I mean, we, we tend to think that we need to be in this really high position to help people. Maybe my contribution won't be really because I don't have the power, because I don't have the money, because I don't make the calls. But actually, you are not going. You are not going to be the one uh, making that that analyze. I mean, maybe you help someone by giving a number away, or maybe just by giving some advice on how to stay strong during this crazy time. Um, and that's that's crucial. I think that we, and and me more related to women. I think women, we are now feeling, I mean, we are in this time of female empowerment, but we we need to, to work more about understanding what, what is this empowerment really about. It's not only about portraying really big campaigns or leading a huge company and becoming the CEO who mm -hmm. will go into a magazine and will inspire others. No, we inspire by yeah. every deed that we do, we do in every minute of our lives. Absolutely. I really think that every small or big thing we, we do, we say, we give to somebody brings a lot of value to, to um, a woman's or a man's identity. 
So it, sometimes it's even just one word, as Katya said before. Some, sometimes it's just one video or one podcast that can't really change somebody's uh, day or life in that moment. Well, we do hope that we're changing lives outside <laughs> right now. <laughs> It's a very specific moment, but but moving moving back to your story and connecting to things that you mentioned, the, the parts of the related to leadership, but also your entrepreneurial background, because you are right now leading a project called Propel Women Who Lead. And we want to know a bit more about it and if you have uh, like some goals to accomplish in 2021. Sure. I like a lot of saying it comes, it says, um, if you have a need, plant a seed. And Propel Woman started or was born out of that, of uh, my personal needs. So I was back then, I was unemployed. Um, I wanted to learn about what does it mean to be um, a woman, a leader in a big organization? I was also feeling a little bit lost in that time. So Strangely enough, I saw many women around me who were insecure about their abilities, about their talents. And I thought, you know what, this is really a great opportunity to, to empower them. And not because I was super empowered at that moment, not because I had all the resources and all the to tools to do it, but I had the passion to do it. And I have that urge of seeing women uh, raising up. So I gather other women with the same vision really amazing teams I have had uh, since the past five years. And we created this program where we could learn from each other, where we could uh, exchange leadership ideas um, and where we could challenge as well, because we need to be challenged from time to time, just that little kick in the ass to, to do something that we know we should be doing, but we don't do it because of fear or uh, whatever comes on our way. So it was a little bit of a, of a network that we created. At the beginning, I thought it would be only for business women, but early I realized that we do not need to have a title to, to have a leader attitude. So I thought, you know what, let us open it to, to everybody who wants, who is interested in the topic. So we had at the end, uh, stay at home moms, we had business leaders, we had students, we have ministry leaders, we have retired women, we had like really a bunch of different people, but we had everybody, uh, somebody in common, uh, something in common that was, we want to grow in this leadership, because if we are at home or outside, we are leading at least one person. So that is Propel uh, for 2021. Has, it has been quite a challenge since the COVID situation because um, many uh, or some ladies from my team has been uh, sick and sickness has been really, um, yeah, has stopped us to move forward. But, you know, I am taking this break as an opportunity to rethink the whole project, to to see maybe we should start doing something or stop doing something, uh, or maybe it's time to pass the button to somebody else or and for me to start something new. So I am really at the stage of rethinking the whole project, but um, for sure something will come up. <laughs> I think, uh, sorry, sorry, Katia, I just all jump in, but we haven't, I think we haven't discussed this yet in this podcast, the importance of knowing when to stop, when to, retire for a bit, went to rest, I think. And we, as women, uh, we tend at times to be like super powerful, uh, like taking it all and holding every pressure in our inside and we, we need to do it. And But I think this, this COVID pandemic, this has taught many things to us, but we yes. haven't, I, I think we, we're still struggling about it. I mean, because it's, it has been so negative that we are still trying to figure out how we feel about the COVID pandemic, our relationship <laughs> with it. But that's really important that we now value more things and we tend to live our lives more slowly in a way. And that's that's really important, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Completely. And actually regarding what you said, Maria, is that, that we need also to spread the message that there's no problem in stop uh, in something for a bit uh, because this is something that I mean, probably the society uh, imposed on us that we need to keep going. You need to, you cannot stop. 
it beat and we can uh, relate it to football also on the pitch or outside of it just don't stop you need to continue doing pressuring things and sometimes we just need a bit of a break to to start uh, to, to have more ideas and to start with a new boost but i need yes. to, to repeat one thing that you said <laughs> <laughs> Maria looks at me. I think she she knew already <laughs> what I was about to say. You said you don't need to have a title to have a leader attitude, and this is exactly I think what we we need. In, and it's connected what I said before the, the society rules. Let's put it out there that you you just achieve a, a leader position when you you have some years of experience or something. No, that I think I'm. I, I agree with you. It's completely different. You can be a leader. I mean, we we have kids that are leaders. I don't know how, but we have some of them. <laughs> and uh, regarding to football, I will push it here. My my part. Uh, something that is very imp important, especially in women's football. To we need to to. You said also that in your project, you you try to have, to be challenged each other. You challenge each other. And this is something that I, I think women's football, the, 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 the women play, uh, players, they need to understand they are leaders already on the pitch and they can have this knowledge mm -hmm. to, and apply, them, uh, apply it outside of the pitch. But they need yes. to be challenged to understand that because some of them, um, actually, we, we always uh, talk about the big names. It's normal. It's completely normal that we mm -hmm. do it. But if we talk about the smaller ones right now, tomorrow they will be big. We need to challenge yeah. these ones to, to say to them, you're a leader. You have a lot of skills yeah. you need to develop um, these skills and, and be even uh, uh, better um, for yeah. them to, to, to have another push. Um, yeah. And connecting this with your actually uh not the position but at least the, the the job where you're performing today the the organization you are at you had to be challenged also for sure <laughs> yeah, yeah from what, very much <laughs> from what you said you've been challenged since you're <laughs> you were born <laughs> <laughs> but right now let's let's focus on this um and actually this is also related to what we're talking about when we talk about what you want to be or where you want to be at uh, if you're talking inside of the pitch, you'll say, you'll point out to the bigger clubs. If you're talking about the industry, you'll point out to the major governing bodies in the football case. And in 2007, you joined the major governing body that is FIFA. So when you want to achieve something, uh, you need to, and you also touched upon this, you need to know the journey, you need to know the pathway and it, that it takes a lot of time. And sometimes mm -hmm. we forget how we can start. We need to start to achieve. If we don't start, it's not Absolutely. really dreaming. So can you please tell us how was your journey to start at FIFA? Uh, where did you find this job offer? Why were you inspired to apply uh, to, apply to it? Uh, can you tell us a bit about this, the whole experience? Yeah, so we were talking about network before, right? Um, and it was through a friend of mine that actually I didn't know really that she was working at FIFA, but she knew that I was looking for, for a job. And I did a birthday party and she said, uh, I invited her and she said, I look Jenny that there is um, at FIFA, they are looking for um, somebody who speaks Spanish. And I think I, she will be really great. Why don't you apply? So she sent me the, the link and it was very nice of her because I had several conversations with her just to get an advice on the interview, on, on what is important and so on. But it was really the normal process of going online, clicking the job offer, apply as everybody else, going through the three interviews in all the FIFA languages. Um, yeah, uh, one of the things that I liked a lot and the reason why I applied to this first job in 2017 was because it has to do a lot um, with what I did in Compassion Switzerland, one of the jobs I had before that was uh, the protection of children. And I didn't know so much the FIFA's background. I knew that it was about football, but I didn't know that they also had a department that was um, advocating or 
taking care of, um, of the transfer of, of children with the aim to protect them. So for me, that was like, okay, that's amazing. It's actually the same uh, passion, but in a different place. So I thought maybe through FIFA, such a big organization, I can also have expand my territory and have a bigger impact. So I thought, okay, uh, let us go for it. But yeah, it was starting thanks to a network. <laughs> Jenny, I mean, you're completely, um, you're right in, a, in the sense that we tend to talk about FIFA and we focus on tournaments. I think that's the, the big thing that we are concerned about, that they are the ones commanding every confederation and that's mm -hmm. it. They, they give resources and that's it. We don't know anything else and they are located in Zurich. Yeah. But could you please, I mean, as you mentioned, your first um, role, you started as counsel for the FIFA player status department. What were your specific responsibilities? What's the goal behind this role? Yeah, so the main part of that job uh, was the international transfers of minor players. So minor players means players between 10 and 18 years old. And FIFA, at FIFA, we said that uh, international transfers are only permitted as of 18 years of age, with some exceptions. So there it comes. With this globalized world, when there are so many reasons why people move from one place to another, uh, our job was really investigating whether the move from one player from one country to the other what was not for reasons related to the player's football career, that it was related for the parents' football career or for um, exchange or for et cetera, reasons that's okay. Um, and all that because there were many cases in the past where agents or other football stakeholders will use this opportunity to take uh, players or kids from uh, South America, from Africa, from Asia, to Europe mainly, and they would just profit from it to make money, but actually the players were in the streets, they were abused, they were alone, and that is something that FIFA is, um, yeah, wants to avoid and wants to fight uh, for um, the regulations are very are very clear but I must also say since I moved out of that department uh, it, everything has been changing so much because these times are changing and yeah we need to to fit to those circumstances but it's really they have really an amazing uh, goal and project there the next question actually will be also related to that in a bit because we, are, we want to know your perspective um, not only from the FIFA side inside, but also yours, um, because you have been from Colombia, now in Switzerland, we have here two different perspectives and, and two different contexts, especially regarding the minors. And what you said, uh, and we know that FIFA is on it, uh, but it's always difficult to, let's say, fiscalize everything. And I have here to, to live uh, one of my bits about, for example, women's football. Um, it's very dangerous what is, can happen in the future because we're talking about a lot of players that are not even professionals. So when you don't have contracts or paperwork <laughs> documents, you cannot trace these movements. It's so important to start doing something. We know that FIFA is doing something, the other governing bodies also, but we need more actually because it's something that is, is developing. Women's football is starting. Um, in, in some countries, it's even... Uh, for me, and we know that, and and uh, for me, it's something that makes me uh, um, very uh, apprehensive because we need to take care of it. Uh, men's football, we know that the rules are out there, but I, I cannot see uh, something that I, I'm always seeing every day: uh, players be signing with agents with 12 years old, and these players are from a club that this club is not even professional, and the league is not even professional. So. How can you trace this? How can you do this? I mean, I cannot understand how can we prevent these uh, situations, but it is what we have and we need to work towards that. But regarding to that, in your opinion, and also if you can give us a bit of FIFA's perspective, because <laughs> you know some <laughs> things. <laughs> um, talking about the future, right? Are there specific challenges to work on to guarantee to the protection of minor players in football? Yes, as I said before, since I left in February, there has been a lot of, of changes in that department. So very hard to make a 
or give you a clear information because I do know from my colleagues that they are also reviewing because you know there is at FIFA there is always this challenge that we want to to promote and to make um, and to open the doors let us say for kids to make their way because there is always this side of we want the players to have the opportunity to to play and to show themselves, but we also want to protect them. And for some people, this can be seen as FIFA is putting a barrier. So that's, that was something I heard a lot in telephone conversations with parents, like, you're not allowing my kid to play. And how is it? So it's always between rules and what the best way FIFA is implemented to protect the players. But yeah, it has both sides. So as you said, um, it is a, uh, as a challenge for all organizations. I do believe that the foundations in the different countries, they are doing a great job uh, informing the parents. I, I always thought, and I still think today that um, communication and providing this knowledge to the parents in, um, in all these countries would be very beneficial. Because when the parents know how this football world and how all this money laundering and all these money issues work, then they will be also probably, hopefully, more protective with their children. But they also don't have all this information because they have nobody to provide it to them. They, only, they can only trust in this one agent, this one person. So that's what makes it very dangerous. All the power goes to this one individual. But when we create ways for the communication and for the information to be spread, I think this can be very um, helpful in the future. Yeah, I think transparency is key in this process. Um, and at the same time, you mentioned something. I think we feel like this not only in football, but also as citizens, we tend to to criticize a lot the rules because oh they're they're regulating me a lot because they don't want me to succeed but at the same time you're forgetting that you're not the only one in the business you're not the only one in society and you need to kind of like use the rules to try and understand and attack some specific problems that are happening and then you can kind of like negotiate and, and yeah. help them understand what's going on and maybe if these rules are too too strict, for example, in, in, yeah. some, in some ways. But in this case, I think talking about protecting minors, this is definitely not something that you need to negotiate first and then you'll see along the right, you need to protect first. I think that's, yeah. that's crucial. And in countries like Colombia, I think we, we suffer a lot from, I mean, it's not that I'm criticizing parents, but they tend to see their young, young daughters and sons as their way out. I mean, their opportunity exactly. to go and become rich and live abroad and I don't know, like get opportunities because they don't have them. And, but they, they mm -hmm. forget that they are still children and they need to, to receive some protection. Absolutely. I remember when we were doing the investigations uh, for us, it includes a lot of checking social media, checking online, what, uh, because many of them will post all of that. And this will be hints for us of what is really going on whether it's the same what we got in paper. And I would see sometimes videos of very young players um, being interviewed and they say, yeah, well, I'm doing all this um, for to be famous one day and, and to give, um, to buy a house for my parents. And as beautiful as, as it sounds, I also love my family and I also want to give my family a lot of benefits. But in that age, it's such a pressure. It's not about enjoying the game anymore. You could see that there is this pressure of I need to be famous and rich and I need to make anything to make it possible. And is there what danger starts? Yeah, you, you feel frustrated when I'm already very, very young age. That's, that's an exactly. issue. But moving into your next role, I mean, you recently... Uh, applied you applied i guess internally and then you get to another position in at fifa as technical leadership coordinator what do you do exactly there and let's try and develop more about what's behind uh fifa as an instructor as an as an organization yeah so right now since february this year i am part of a fantastic fast growing team actually <laughs> in the technical leadership programs 
And um, at the moment, what we are uh, doing is organizing um, programs or tailored workshops uh, to equip the technical directors in the 211 member associations. So what does it mean? We organize leadership workshops, management uh, workshops and technical um, in order to help them to diversify, to grow in their role. Um, but we are also aiming to expand these workshops and this knowledge to other leaders within uh, the member associations. So in other words, what we are doing is really equipping, empowering, uh, encouraging the, the leaders in, in their technical departments so that they can do the same with their teams and that they can grow their teams and the game of football in their countries. Amazing. And this is what we need, right? It's, it's spreading the word. And actually, you, you just said, I think, what Maria also said before. We, we, when we say we, we, we are talking about the global perspective, <laughs> not we because we are inside of the industry, we know, of course. But people think that FIFA is the governing body that sends the money and tells the others to do something. Actually, they need to understand the structures inside the departments and everything that is being done. Uh, and we, we've been seeing it now, even more with, through the communication channels that FIFA has, the, the work that is, has been done at the, part, the departments the different uh, uh, range of things that you've been doing with the, I remember now FIFA journal that you launched uh, some, some time ago and another things that we are, we are seeing what you're doing. And when you don't see it, you, you just don't know what is, <laughs> is happening. But when you see it, you have everything out there and this is perfect. But now yeah. let's go to the last question, unfortunately, but uh, <laughs> let's enter in a topic that I already touched upon here a lot because I have to do it. <laughs> it's women's football. Go for it. <laughs> <My God. laughs> yeah, I need to, to do it. Um, and again, it's a uh, the women's game. Let's call it like that. Is the game of, of everybody, but the, played by women. Uh, we know that is uh, in its development. It's starting in the. Um, if we take it in a consideration, the the con in the context uh, global in a global way. We are developing, we have different con contexts. We know that <laughs> every part of the world is uh, different. And we know through Two Goals podcast that this is very true because we have different perspectives. But yeah. what is your perspective on women's football development pathway? Does the future look bright to you in this area? And where do you, where do you see yourself contributing to it in the subsequent years? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. You know, as I mentioned before, I support women in the football industry, if it's in the offices, if it's um, on the field, or whatever they want to be, actually, for me, it's just seeing women really shining, whatever they think they can make a difference. And so in that line, I really see that in the past years, there has been a lot of awareness, I can see a lot of new opportunities. Uh, opportunities are increasing for women in the sports industry. Um, I can see also how FIFA and how other organizations they have uh, in their agenda to, to make a difference. Uh, so I, I do see that there is, it's quite positive what is going on. Um, from what concerns me uh, in, in my new team, I feel very empowered. I feel very supported in what I am doing. And honestly, I really hope to be very intentional um, in using the opportunities that has been given to me to empower other women or to make the way for those who are coming. Because um, yeah, it's, it's all about leaving a legacy and, and making healthy foundations for everyone else to, to come on. And I hope I will be uh, doing that and expanding the territory of influence for myself and for everybody, all, all the other women um, behind. However, he, at this point, um, you know, I'm, I read a lot about what is happening with all this. Uh, this feminism movements and and I find that great everybody is really trying to have a voice in yeah in today's times and and I think that's fine but we need to be very careful that we do not see the men as our rivals I have had men that has encouraged me and helped me to make my journey 
been successful. So they are not our rivals. We need men and women at the table at every decision making place or, yeah. I do think that we women need to be very, um, very careful with that and see that is it, it is our insecurities actually and our self-imposed limitations that are our rivals and not men. So it's, um, it's just not to go in any of the extremes and just work together and collaborate together. What is the most important? Perfect. It's just perfect what you say. I, I know that I repeat myself, but I have to. I, I know where you do by, the, by your face. Because this is something that we always say here, of course, in a different way. But we say it and when we created this podcast, one of the things that was right on, right straight away on the table was to have men as, as guests. Because this is not only a place for women. Uh, of course, we want to portray women in football and women's football but there for example women's football there are men's working at women's football let's show them because the, it's not only a women's place we need to understand also that it's very important that all the movements that we, we've seen in out there we need them but at the same time to understand that the world is, we work with humans and this is i think is the way that we can we need to see the world we are humans well the equality is about that we are humans we are the same it's basically regardless of the gender so it's it's, uh, it's that go maria let, let me just add something and i think we learned this uh, or we discussed this with a former guest and the, the thing is how to focus our energy into finding the people that want to work for this cause i mean we tend to work a lot into going against those who are not who are very traditional who, who are not i mean like familiar or they don't like women coming into these positions. I mean, in football inside or outside the pitch, but we need to, I mean, at times we need to struggle against that and we need to change yeah. these structures, these hierarchies, but we should definitely focus more into finding those stakeholders who are in, who want to achieve the same things. I mean, that's, that's where our energy should go. I mean, in a positive yeah. way, let's try and find those who are already interested in working or towards the same goal. That's really important. I like that what you say is true. Is where uh, choose your battles, and we should choose uh, the, the positive side. And whatever comes as a challenge, then we can also see it as an opportunity for us women to be pioneers yeah. in changing mindsets and being the change agents, whatever we are. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, then the network is very important because when we have so much coming against us, we need to be empowered by somebody else in order to keep going. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's very hard. <laughs> no, exactly. And I will hear this year, there is people out there, choose your battles. This was what you said, and it's exactly that. <laughs> I mean, we need to, to understand that also. So, but Jenny, sorry, we, we are sorry that this is ending at least for us because <laughs> we love it. <laughs> I love the conversation. Thank you so much. We need to thank you for being here with us, telling us your, your journey from Colombia to Switzerland and how you accomplished your positions in the industry and in life as well. That is very important. It's very important to have examples like yours and we hope a little girl or a woman all over the world, especially in Colombia. And uh, Maria is happy about that. I hope they can dream about a pathway like yours. And uh, we, we hope she can achieve it as well. You inspired us both here today. Just be sure out of that. And when this is out, we are pretty sure that you will inspire others. So thank you, Jenny. Thank you so much, Katia and Maria. Thank you. And uh, to all of you, don't forget to listen to all our episodes available on podcast platforms, including YouTube. And also follow us on Instagram and Twitter with the name Two Goals Podcast. Thank you and take care. <laughs>